I want you to take on the role of a researcher. And you've been put in charge of answering the question, what percentage of Americans support the legalization of marijuana? But you quickly run into a problem. How could you possibly ask every American this question? It would be too time consuming, it would be too expensive. Just imagine trying to track down over 330 million people. It's near impossible. So what do you do? A colleague suggests to engage in sampling. But what is sampling? How does it work? What are the different types of sampling? Well, that's what we'll talk about today. So stick around. So let's start by breaking down two fundamental concepts. What is the difference between a population and a sample? Now let's start with population. The population represents the entire set of something that you wish to study. And the reason we use the word something is because the population could be many different things. Your population, for example, might be all the people who live in a specific city. It could also be a specific subgroup. Your population could be all men or all women or all newborn babies. And your population can also be specific things or objects. Maybe your population is all the cars on the road and you want to know, you know how many of them are electric. So the population is the entirety of something. Now, another way to look at a population is the fact that it can vary in size. You can have a giant population, right? It could be the entire size of a country. Example, United States, right? That's gigantic to as small as a nursing home, right? Maybe you want to do a research study on aging and you visit a nursing home. That's your population to as small as a classroom, right? Maybe a classroom of 50 preschoolers. So the population can vary in many different ways, subgroups, things, but also vary in size. Also note that the population is represented by the letter N, the capital letter N. So you ever see a capital letter on equals and a number, you know they're referring to the population. So then it becomes, what is our sample? The sample is a part of the population, or it is a subset of a population. Okay, so like a smaller percentage of the population. And instead of the capital letter N, you might denote a sample with a lowercase n. Okay, so we have capital for a population and a sample would be a lowercase n. Now you might be thinking, why have a sample in the first place, right? If I'm handing out a survey, why not just give it to everybody in my population? Well, if it's a classroom, that's pretty manageable. But if I'm trying to hand out a survey to 330 million people, it's difficult to almost near impossible. So because of that, we take a small percentage of that population and that becomes our sample or the specific number of people in our sample become the sample size. And if you have a really good sample, in other words, if the sample is representative of the population in terms of age and educational background and income, and we'll dive into representation in a moment, you can draw inferences about the population. Right? So I can draw inferences, meaning draw conclusions, inferences. If I have a really good sample, I don't necessarily need to ask everybody, right? I only need a small percentage. So let's come back to our question. What percentage of Americans support the legalization of marijuana? What would be our population? Now, I bet a lot of you are thinking, well, it's all Americans, but are we sure? Can you ask babies that question? Can you ask toddlers that question? So when you think about it that way, our population is actually not the entire United States. We're gonna say our population is everybody over the age of 18 because they can give consent and they can actually answer our questions. So for our purposes, remember uppercase N, we're gonna say our population is everybody over the age of 18. And that is roughly 200 million Americans. I feel like doing awesome powers, 200 million Americans. And our lowercase n, right, our sample, we're gonna say is about 2,000 people, okay? And I'm kind of just making that up. But you might be thinking, you can have 2,000 people and generalize your results to an entire country? Well, you can, if it's a good sample. And what good means, we will cover in the next few moments. Okay, so now that we have our population for sample, what's next? I want us to understand there are various ways you can do sampling. So let me give an example. Sampling, as I've written up here, comes in two forms. We have one called non-probability sampling. 
probability. And we also have probability sampling. Non-probability, our top one, is often based on the idea of convenience, right? Who's around me, right? Who are the people close to me to make this easier? You're close to me, all right, you can be in my study. This is why we call this convenience sampling. Or maybe it's volunteer. I wanna be in your study. Okay, well, that's easy. But what we really wanna focus on is probability sampling because this is based on chance. And the reason this is important is every member of a population has an equal chance to be in your study. And that way we can account for individual differences among groups, age, gender, race, and everybody is accounted for. You can make better inferences from the sample to the population. So for this video, we're gonna focus on two types of probability sampling. They are called random sampling and stratified sampling, all right? So what's the difference? Let's start with the first one. So random sampling begins with a population. And for a population, let's just imagine, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people in our population. Well, how do we get those people in our sample? What we do is a process called, and this is extremely important, random selection, okay? Random selection is the root of probability sampling. And essentially, it's like picking names out of a hat, right? You're in my study, you're not in my study. You're in my study, you're not in my study, right? There's picking out of a hat. It ensures that everybody in my population has an equal chance to be in my sample. Now, typically, it's not putting names in a hat. Typically, you'll put names in a computer or an Excel sheet, and you just randomize them, and it just randomly picks people, right? So I put these names in a computer, and it randomly picks them, and my sample becomes participant three, participant five, and participant six, right? Totally random, okay? So there's our population, and that becomes our sample. Remember that random sampling is based on random selection. Now, let's focus on the sample. The key to a good sample is that it is representative of the population. So what does that mean? It means that all the characteristics and, and features of the population, right, different ages, different genders, uh, different incomes, different backgrounds, uh, are represented in the sample. So for example, if 50% of my population are women, what percentage of my sample should also be women? 50%, that makes it representative. So we can essentially have two types of samples. We can have a representative sample, representative sample. And the reason this is important, as we talked about before, is you're able to generalize those results, right? Make go back to the population. And essentially, we are labeling this as high external, external validity. Okay, external validity refers to the idea of being able to generalize your findings to the real world, all right, to the general population. So if you have a good representative sample, which is done through random selection, you'll have high external validity. But what if you don't have a good sample, right? What if your sample isn't representative of the population, right? Let's say 50% of your population is women, but your sample only has 10% women. Well, that's gonna be a biased sample, okay? Or we can label it as sampling bias, okay? A biased sample or sampling bias. And because of this, instead of having high external validity, which is key to a good study, this is gonna result in low external validity, okay? In other words, we are not validity, gonna be able to generalize our results to the population. And this is gonna be a lot to lead to a lot of errors in our study. So there's random sampling. Now, one question I always get from my students is, does it matter how many people are in your sample? Yeah, it does. I mean, there's really two big things to think about. How big is your population and how much variation is in it, right? If you're studying a classroom, you might not need a big sample, but if you're studying an entire country, then yeah, you need a little bigger of a sample size. And also, it's due to the amount of variation in that population, right? If you're a psychological researcher, you're studying rats. Well, there's not much differences between rats. I mean, a rat is a rat, they're all the same. I know I'm gonna get hate mail about people who own rats, but people are very different, right? We have different ages, weights, heights, religions, backgrounds, everything is so different. So because of those differences, you'll need a larger sample size. 
So how can we use random sampling in our question, what percentage of Americans support the legalization of marijuana? Well, you could technically get everybody a number, right? 200 million people, a number, and you put them in a generator, some sort of Excel sheet computer, and it, you press a button and it randomizes them. You could do that, but that would be pretty hard. But what's a little easier is what if we did zip codes, right? What if we identify all the zip codes in America? And by the way, I had to look this up. There are over 40,000 zip codes. So instead of 200 million, we got 40,000 zip codes. You put them in a computer, you press randomize, and it spits out, let's say, 3,000 zip codes, okay? And from those zip codes, you're able to gather information about the people who live within that zip code. And you're able to send out, you know, mail to them and email them and call them or do door to door, right? You're able to contact them. And that way, you're not doing everybody, but you're essentially, you know, going to different parts, right? Each one of these green dots represents a zip code. So we're not going door to door in every single town in America. We're doing it so we can space it out. Everybody gets a equal chance in America to be in our study. And it's easier, it's less time consuming. We'll make phone calls, we'll, we'll send out telegrams, we'll do, we'll do mail, all those kind of things. Don't forget Hawaii, don't forget Alaska, right? So that way everybody has, has an equal chance represented. So that is a nice way to do it. You can use zip codes. All right, so what's our last example of probability sampling? That is called stratified sampling. Now, why would we use stratified over random? As I just said before, the greater the population, right, the bigger the population, the more variation, this is a better method. Let's break it down. So the reason we call this stratified sampling is because the word strata means layer, right? You might've heard the word stratified like st the stratosphere, right? One of the layers of the atmosphere, okay? So we have many layers that we're kind of dissect, okay? So here's our population. And imagine that each one of these colors represents gender, race, and income, okay? So we'll say, you know, uh, gender is going to be this color and race is going to be this color and income is this color, okay? When you have a population, that has a lot of differences in it, okay? Like a country. How do you ensure that every group is representative? Because historically, a lot of subgroups are not representative, right? People low income or specific minority groups. It's, a, it's really hard to get a hold of those people, you know, through mail and, and telephone and things like that. So we need a way to make sure that every group, every group of the population is represented. And the way to do that is stratified sampling. And here's how it works. Each one of these circles represents what we call a strata. So here's a strata, and here's a strata, and here's a strata. So these represents strata, a subgroup, okay? A subgroup of a population, okay? And the first thing we do, instead of doing random selection from here, we first divide people equally. So we're gonna put all of the, you know, all females, all women into our strata. Okay, so we first put them here. And then we will put everybody who let's say is, you know, African American in this strata. There we go. And then we will put everybody, let's say, in the middle class, right? People who are middle class into this strata. So we first take everybody in a population and we divide them into specific strata. So we'll have an arrow here, arrow here, and arrow here, okay? All right, so now that we've divided everybody into their specific strata, what do we do? We do what we did in our random sampling, which is then we do a random selection from each strata, okay? So here's our random selection, like, you know, picking names out of a hat. So we might, might put, you know, all you know, women and everybody's African American, everybody in middle class income into a database and it randomizes them. So it's an equal chance to be in our sample. So randomly, you know, this person has to be chosen and this person is chosen and then this person is chosen. And then those three become part of our sample. This first person and second person and our third person, right? So this way, using stratified, we ensure, especially in a population with a lot of variability,
that every specific subgroup is accounted for, all right? So that way we can make better inferences about the population and each subgroup as well. And how might this apply to our question, what percentage of Americans support the legalization of marijuana? Well, you'd probably do a stratified sampling because of the size of America and countries in general, right? So you could take, you know, we have gender, race, and income. You could also do educational background. You could do, I don't know, age, right? You can do a lot of different things to make sure that everybody is accounted for. And that's a nice way to answer that question. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I really hope you learned something. Please look down in the comment section. I put an example problem where you have identified the sample and population. Test your knowledge. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, take care.